Hey, good morning, Hope Church. Hope everyone is doing well on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. I say beautiful, it's breezy. But um, I said we start at 10.30 and I have about 10 seconds for that. So anyway, it's good to be here to connect with you and uh, look forward to sharing Hopefully a good word with you. All right, it's, it is 10.30 on the nose. I see we have a few people starting to pop on. Uh, really quickly, before we get started, uh, again, Mark Jordan, lead pastor at Hope Church. I'm delighted to see you. I'm glad that you decided to join us online, and it is good to see you here. If you will, go ahead and thumbs up, like, love, whatever. Let us know that you were here. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do the Facebook Live is because I want to try to push and drive some engagement. So feel free. Uh, to make comments, to ask questions. I'm uh, probably not going to dig into a whole lot of those as we're going along, but I will keep up with this uh, throughout the afternoon and the day and uh, make sure that we uh, that I'm interacting and answering questions and things like that that you have. So please do not hesitate uh, to hop in and let me know if you have any questions. Begin this likes, loves, let's push some engagement uh, and interact, like kind of like we would do if we were in the facility. Uh, this morning, even though we are in the comfort of our own homes. And uh, just let everybody know where you are. We're in my house. This is my home office. It was a living room, oh, sorry, dining room that we converted to a living room, which is where I keep my desk and I have my, my stuff. So a lot of the videos, you've seen this uh, background, but this is my home office. Okay, a couple uh, really quick little housekeeping things too before we dig into the message is I want to encourage you to go to placeofhope.org slash online. You can just go to the church website, placeofhope.org. Uh, and while you're there, check out um, kids ministry offerings. Uh, we also have announcement videos there that uh, Jacob did, and we have um, our worship music for today. We have a guest worship leader. I mentioned that in the video on Friday. Guest worship leader, uh, Reese Spencer, and um, we'll do some more introductions of Reese of, of Reese in the coming days. Uh, but I want you to have an opportunity to see and to hear Reese uh, again. He he came to the church on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, and we, we shot some recording videos of him and had an opportunity to get to know him a little bit better. And uh, I think uh, you'll appreciate the music that Reese brings. And uh, we're looking to maybe uh, have Reese here in the Hope Church Band a little bit more frequently. So anyway, give it a watch. Give it a listen. Uh, make sure you check out the announcements, uh, informations for, information for kid ministry, as well as um, links to online giving. So anyway, it's all important. It's all cool. All right, so our scripture lesson, well, our message today is entitled, that Living Hope. I'm pulling up my notes. It's entitled That Living Hope. And uh, this is a kind of a follow-up, carry-on from last week's message. If you didn't have a chance to grab that, you can uh, make sure to grab it online. Uh, we talked about Doubting Thomas. And one of the reasons I wanted to do a carryover here is uh, in Jesus' interaction with Doubting Thomas, we know him as Doubting Thomas, but in Jesus' interaction with Thomas, he makes this statement. He said, blessed uh, are you because you believe, because you've seen, but blessed are those who have believed without having the opportunity or the ability to see. And I used kind of a tagline that my dad would share with me a lot when I was younger. And he would say, sometimes people need to see things to believe, but the real power comes when we recognize that we can only believe that, or so we can only see things through our belief. So I kind of butchered that uh, from last week, but uh, some people need to see to believe, uh, but when it comes to our spiritual life, oftentimes we have to believe in order to see. And that was essentially the message, and we'll close some announcement. Um, anyway, that was essentially the message that we talked about last week. Uh, and so as we, we dig in today, I want you to kind of start with that filter of how oftentimes we need, uh, we, we, we live within this uh, conflict, so to speak, about needing to see in order to believe, but in reality, we need to believe in order to see. So let's dig into our scripture lesson today. It comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, and I'm reading out of the New International Version. And this is a letter that Peter wrote, um, that Peter wrote. So let's, let's dig into this together. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's where the title of the message comes, Living Hope. Picking up with verse four, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. The inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the... I'm sorry. These have come so that the proven genuineness of their faith, 
of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So some really good stuff there, but Peter's talking about the power that gets activated. I'm going to use a word today called animated, but the power that gets animated in us when we are able to connect the hope that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he is, he is exactly who he said he is, uh, and how that motivates us for living right now. But we still are in this world right now where we are struggling between things that we see and things that we can't see. Let's make it really, um, let's, let's make it, you know, really timely, right? Guess what I have here on my desk? It is a model of coronavirus. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> It really isn't a model of coronavirus, but in my mind, when I started seeing those uh, pictures on the TV screen and stuff, I started thinking, that looks a lot like a ball that we have somewhere. And so while we're in the process of uh, cleaning up our house and getting ready to put it on the market, we actually found this going through one of Mia's toy boxes the other day. Uh, it, and it, it, to me, it looks kind of like a model of the coronavirus. Now, so, of course, the coronavirus itself is microscopic. You can't see it with the naked eye. But you look around, and we have absolutely no reason to believe the coronavirus isn't real, right? Because we, we, we hear about it. We see the effects of it. We see what it's done to people's lives. We see what it does to people's health. And we see what it's done to our economy. And so we look around, and, we, and even though we can't see the coronavirus, we have this knowledge in our head and our heart that it's real. And one of the reasons that we do that is because we believe the people who are talking about it. We believe the doctors, the scientists, the uh, virologists. We believe all those people because, I mean, that's what their expertise is. They have that experience and they're sharing that with us. So we believe in something even though we can't necessarily see it. We can't see it, but we certainly, as I mentioned, we can see the effect of it, can't we? We can see how the coronavirus has wreaked havoc on people's lives, how it's wreaked havoc on people's health, and it's wreaking havoc on the economy, not just here in the United States, but all over the world. So... I just, I'm sorry, I should have turned off that before. Anyway, so um, so we, we see what we have here. We can't necessarily see it, but we know that it's there. We know that it is real because we believe in it. Now, one of the things that makes it so much, um, what makes it so powerful for us to see is because it also has this ability to channel into our fears. Now, last Sunday, we talked a good bit about overcoming fear with faith. And so uh, one of the reasons that we are so willing to give over some of our lives and our freedoms and things, at least temporarily, more on that in a moment. But the reason we're willing to do that is because we believe in the people who talk to it. But it also helps to activate our fear, which would cause us to do things that we ordinarily probably wouldn't necessarily do. And so we have this reality that we are living with within our fear, even though we can't necessarily uh, see it or touch it. Now, there's this, there's this teaching point that I learned years ago that really, really, really really activates my faith. And it said that the devil's greatest victory isn't in convincing us that God isn't real, but that he, the devil, isn't real. Now think about that. It isn't that the devil's greatest victory is convincing us that God isn't real, but that he isn't real. And so the connection that we see here is what happens when we think that there isn't something out there that can hurt us, but then we begin to see the effects of it, and then that activates our fear. And so as a result of our fear being activated, what it does within our lives is it causes us to do things, to think things, to say things that we probably wouldn't ordinarily say. And so we are activating our fear and not our faith. But as I mentioned last week, fear and faith are processed in the same part of the brain. So we have a choice that we get to make in terms of how are we going to respond to something that we cannot see. Are we going to respond in fear or are we going to respond in faith? And so that is a huge, huge challenge for us. When we look at what Peter wrote, though, talking about the seen and the unseen, there's something miraculous that happens when our faith is activated and we begin to not just process things on the things on the sake of the fear that we feel, but we begin to process things on what we really truly believe is possible and is capable if we allow our faith to be activated animated. And so that is really, really important for us to process. You know, when you see a 2D picture of the coronavirus on the screen, of course, this isn't a real model, but a little ball that I, I found, it begins to make it more real in our lives. Animation is the process of taking two-dimensional 
drawings and helping us to see them through a three-dimensional filter. And that's exactly what we are perceiving when we are called to, and challenged to process our experiences with faith and not just fear. We have to make our hope come alive. We have to allow it to be animated, if you will. Now, I'm a Disney file, love Disney, and one of the things that uh, really inspires me is how Walt Disney created so much technology and is still doing so today. But when he was working on the Snow White and the Seven Dwarves um, feature film, it was the first animated uh, feature length film, what he did is he developed the technology so that he could make two-dimensional cartoons that he was making come to life even more to add depth to them. And I can't help but think of that without reading uh, what the Apostle Paul wrote when he talked about how he wants our hope and our love to be animated, so to speak, my words, but he had said this, I want you to understand the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of the love of God for you in Jesus Christ. Paul's talking about animating that hope and animating that faith so that we don't just see it as a two-dimensional object, but we see it as something that has height and depth and width and breadth. We take something that is two-dimensional, we animate it to make it feel real. And so with all this stuff in the coronavirus going on, I'm reminded of uh, Fred Rogers' great things that when tragedies happen, look for the helpers. Look for the people like the first responders who are putting their life on the line, going to circumstances. They have no idea what's going to meet them on the other side, yet they go. The people who are in the medical community who are treating people who are deathly, uh, terribly ill. Uh, those in the faith community who've been essentially... Um, shut out of the churches, but I think God's will is for us to take church to the street, to be the church, not just go to church, right? Look for all the heroes. Look for the ways that people are animating their faith, animating their belief, animating their lives, so that even in a time when we're experiencing a pandemic and going through a shutdown, it's not that life completely stops. We can look at the helpers and we can see those who are putting their lives on the line, those people who are working 24-7, 365, to try to help people find the hope and animate their lives because of that hope. And that's what I want us to do, to find that living hope, to animate it. And so when we look at the passage that we have from 1 Peter chapter 1 today, um, there are a lot of things we could look at, but I want us to look at three basic concepts that Peter, uh, that I pulled out from Peter's writing to help us, you know, come to an understanding of what it is that he wants us to do, what he wants us to accomplish. The first thing that um, I think Peter wants us to look at is the idea of righteousness, the idea of righteousness. Now, when we think about righteousness, it probably has uh, a lot of religious overtones to it, right? But basically, the meaning of righteousness is to make things right in, in our lives, in our lives with God particularly. But what if I told you that righteousness isn't just a religious term, it's a relational term? Think about that for a minute. Righteousness isn't just a religious term, it's a relational term. I think about in my own life and uh, in our home life here with Tiffany and Ethan and me basically in the same space for you know four or five weeks now. There have been a couple times, and uh, my dad warned Tiffany before we married that I could be a little difficult to live with. Uh, there were a couple times when uh, the things that I said or the way that I behaved or things I didn't say or didn't, didn't do things the way I said I'd do kind of created a little uh, fissure, so to speak, in that relationship. Now, we're bonded, we're tight, we're strong. Uh, but, you know, in a relational sense, there are times when I just goofed up. And as a result of that, there was just a little bit of a breakdown in that relationship. Now, we weren't going to break up by any stretch of the imagination. But there was a little bit of, you know, a friction there. So what happens when we're in a, one of our key primary core relationships and we have a little bit of a struggle? You know, what do we do? We, we make it right. We go say, you know, in my case, honey, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have behaved that way or I was being stupid. I'm experiencing stress or what all this other stuff. We make it right. Uh, and, and in those cases, you know, <laughs> Tiffany was like, well, yeah, you were being stupid. But it's okay, Right. It's okay. Our relationship is more important than the stupidity, even though that's just a, you know, part of life. And so our relationship with God works in much the same way, right? He wants us to be righteous. And Jesus talked about live a righteous life because God is righteous. This is what he wants. He's talking about a relational sense. You know, God knows the stupid things that we do or say or the things that we don't do. We say we're going to do them or, you know, things that we don't say. God knows those things. But he's a God of grace and mercy because of his love. He's a God of grace and mercy. You know, just to break those two words down really quickly. Grace is giving us a love that we don't deserve and mercy is withholding a punishment from us that we do. And so the righteousness of God says, yeah, I know, but I, want, I know you did something that you shouldn't have done. You said something you shouldn't have said, but I want our relationship to be solid. I want it to be tight. I want to make it right. And so come to me, pray to me, ask for forgiveness. 
And so that's what righteousness is all about. It's not just this religious term that we can't live into. It's a relational term that we know all too well about how to live and how to work with other people. We make those goof-ups. And righteousness is about making it right and making it right from God's point of view that God sent Jesus into our lives to forgive us, to save us so that we can be redeemed and restored for ministry in the world, to be some of those helpers like Mr. Rogers talked about, to go put our lives out there, to serve meals, to work with people who are home hungry or homeless or struggling or suffering, to be animated hope in the world, that living, that living hope. So it comes under righteousness, right? It comes under righteousness, getting our relationships right with God and each other. And this comes down to love. We're called to love. Love is the commandment that Jesus gave us to love one another. And people will know that we belong to him based on the way that we love other people. So love is key to that relational component that we hear and see as righteousness. It comes back to John 16, right? 316. God so loved the world. And through Jesus, God wants to make the world right. John 317. It's how this all comes down. So it comes down to love. We believe, we look at faith through the theology of John Wesley, a Wesleyan point of view. And John Wesley believed in the power of love and how to have the ability to perfect somebody. Now, that doesn't mean that perfection and love uh, is described by us never making any mistakes. But what it does say is that we have a pure uh, perspective and we actually have a motivation. That's the word I was looking for. We, we believe in the, re we have a, a love-based reason for why we do things the way that we do. And so the thing that's so powerful and so beautiful about love in that regard is even when we goof up, even when we goof up, that we can go to someone who we have a little broken relationship with and say, you know, I love you. I didn't mean anything by it. Will you forgive me? Can we experience the restoration of our relationship? And so when Jesus talks about the greatest commandment, to love God with all that you have and all that you are and to love your neighbor as yourself, it comes down to that motivation. What motivates you or what animates you? What brings your hope to life? And it comes down to love. It comes down to love. To love God with all that your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. This is the relational sense of righteousness put into action, animated, brought off the page and out into the world. It comes down to love. Because, and we can have this love, and we can know this love is real because Christ has already won the victory. It comes down to that third concept, that third component, victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever, right? He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. It's victory in Jesus. It's experiencing that victory. Now, Peter referred to this as the great inheritance. And depending on his audience, they would have read that and experienced the wholeness of what God was trying to offer, but it, they would have seen it through their own individual, unique, personalized filter that would help them understand where they were coming from. If it was a Jewish audience and they hear the idea of the great inheritance, they're probably taken back to the time when God brought the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt through the, prom through the desert and into the promised land. The promised land was their great inheritance. The promised land was that great inheritance. But for those who were in a, in a non-Jewish audience, for those who were in the Gentile population that Peter was compelled to carry that message of Christ to, they probably read it in, in a similar way, but perhaps a little bit different because so much of this was Roman Empire territory. And the Roman Empire, you know, they could be brutal, right? I mean, look at what happened to Christ on the cross. It could be brutal. And so the idea of this great inheritance that Peter is writing about, whether you come, from it, come to it from a Jewish perspective or a Gentile perspective, it is all about an inheritance that cannot be taken away by an invading army or an invisible enemy. Peter talks about a living hope, an animated hope, so to speak, is something that can't be taken away from you. It can't be ransacked. It can't be destroyed. It can't be taken from you. And in the time that he was writing this, Israel itself, the promised land, was being occupied by Roman force. And he's trying to tell people whether they, whatever side of that Roman Empire they were on, that the hope that they have in Christ, it cannot be taken from them. It cannot be stolen from them. And as a result, they need to believe that Christ is real, that he accomplished what he said he was going to do. And the world is forever different 
as a result. That victory comes when we know that God so indeed does love us and he wants to make things right between us to redeem our lives and to restore us for effective ministry in the world around us. One of the things that really strikes me about the mission statement for Hope Church, and I love it, is to introduce people to the love of God and to fuel their hope for him, to fuel that relationship. And friends, that's what we're called to do right now. That's who we're called to be. We're called to be the animated love and hope of God in our community and throughout all creation to help people know that God is real, he loves us and has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And though sometimes the threats, uh, we can't see them, we can see the effect of the hope, oh, wait, I'm not hope, we can see the, the effect of the threat, but the beautiful thing is that that's not where Jesus leaves us. That's not where Jesus leaves us at all. He wants us to motivate and animate our hope. So it isn't just two-dimensional. It isn't just something on a page. It's something that is motivating us and animating us to get out into the world, to be that living hope for the people so desperately need to see in you and me. And so how can, how can we animate our hope in our lives today so that when people look at us, they see the hope of Christ? It comes in maybe helping to, uh, to break, or not to, um, to enter back into some of those broken relationships, to experience that righteousness that God did for us that he's asking us to do with and for others. It's asking us to love, to make love our motivating principle. And it's about taking that victory that we experience even when the enemies are seen or unseen to know that no one can take that victory from you. No one can, see, no one can steal the victory that Jesus has already sealed. That's what I've been trying to get out of my noggin all morning. No one can steal the victory that Jesus has sealed for you. And so, my friends, I hope that you will take that living hope and you will allow it to animate your life and animate your love so that your hope is animated, that we may take this hope and love of God in Christ Jesus out into the community and throughout our creation during this time of social distancing and lockdowns and all this other stuff to animate our hope, to help people who are hungry, to help people who are hopeless, and to help folks know that beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is real, God loves them and has a plan and a purpose for their lives, for your life, for my life and our lives together. And so friends, that's our message. That's our living hope. And, and I hope that you will allow it to animate you and to motivate you to be the person who Christ has created and called you to be. And I hope that you will carry that living hope out into a world that so desperately needs it. Uh, in a moment, I'm gonna close this with prayer. And uh, again, I appreciate all the, the comments and the engagement. I'm gonna look at these when we get done here. Uh, and also too, just as a little, another little nugget of housekeeping, we are gonna save this and post it to our website so that uh, you can share this either via Facebook or via um, the rest of the interwebs uh, if you would like for someone who you know uh, to, to hear this message and to contemplate how we can uh, animate our hope to be uh, that three-dimensional presence of God in the world. If there's any way I can be of assistance, if you want to think together, talk together, pray together, I invite and encourage you to reach out to me. My email address, probably the best way right now, is mark at placeofhope.org. Again, that's mark at placeofhope.org, and I invite you to connect with us there. Again, you can check out the announcements, worship music from Ray Spencer, as well as um, activities for our kids' ministries, and, uh, and of course, links for online giving. But let us animate our hope today so that by all the ways that we are called to be the people of God in this community and throughout all creation, that we can let and help people see and know beyond the shadow of a doubt, and kind of my three points in my mission statement, that God is real, he loves us, and has a plan and a purpose for our lives. Let's motivate, animate, and live into that hope today. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, I give you thanks for this day and for that living hope that you've given us in Christ Jesus. In the text of the Bible message that we read today, it is important for us to remember that Peter commented on how our hope gets resurrected with Jesus, which indicates that there was probably a cruel, brutal death that preceded it. But Lord, it is because of that cruelty and brutality that we can see how powerful and poignant and potent hope really is when we live into it with and for you. And so Lord God, forgive us for those times when we have allowed our hope lives to get slack and animate us so that we may be that living hope in the world that is so desperately in need of it. Help us to bring the words and the message of hope 
off the two-dimensional page and to live it in three-dimensional life so that people may truly see that you are real and you love us and have a plan and a purpose for our lives. We thank you for Jesus who came to set us right with you and to help us to see how we can help set uh, other people right as well. And so may we embody that in righteousness and the relationship with the love that we, we feel and we experience with you and with each other so that we may live victoriously in a world knowing that Satan can't steal what you have already sealed. I pray this in the holy living name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I will post reflection questions in the comment section below so that you can have an opportunity to look at these and discuss these with your small group, with your family, your friends, or you know, whoever else. But I just want to invite and encourage you to go be animated, live that two-dimensional uh, hope life in the world, don't let the invisible enemy uh, get you down. Uh, help him to know, I mean, help everyone to know uh, that Jesus loves you and he wants you to live and hope for all the world. So uh, let's go do it, folks. You with me? Let's go do it. Amen. Hey, thank you for joining us. Look forward to seeing you soon.